Hey humans, it's Hannah. Welcome back to the channel and welcome to your next episode of Can't Look Away. If you just randomly clicked on this video and you're new to this channel, we do videos on creepy and disturbing things here. Hi and welcome. If this is the first Can't Look Away episode you've watched, this is a series on my channel where instead of just one topic for the whole video, we actually go through five different stories and I try really hard to find not only interesting, disturbing stories, but ones that you likely have not heard of before. We have some really crazy stories to go into today. As the disclaimer says at the beginning, these topics are disturbing. There will be nothing graphic. Everything will align with YouTube's guidelines. However, it may be disturbing to some viewers. So as always, viewer discretion is advised. Before we get into it today, this video is supported by a sponsor. So we're going to roll to that and I'll be right back with you. I am so excited to talk to you guys about today sponsor, which is Nutrafol. Listen, thinning hair is different for everyone and a one size fits all approach to it is just not going to work. That's why Nutrafol is the best way to go. Nutrafol has five different formulas that are tailored to your hair's needs. So you can achieve visibly thicker, stronger, faster growing hair in as little as three to six months. They have a three minute hair wellness quiz on their website so you can find out right now what formula is right for you. Nutrafol is the number one dermatologist recommended hair growth supplement with over 1 million people seeing thicker, stronger, faster growing hair and less shedding. It's also just a really easy thing to add to your routine. I got the women's vegan capsules and all you do is take four capsules every day with a meal for better hair. I've been taking them for the past few weeks and I've already noticed a little bit of progress in my shedding. Anyone else like able to build a wig out of the hair that they find in the shower? And I already feel like taking Nutrafol for the past few weeks has like slowed down the shedding a little bit. So I'm super encouraged and and I'm definitely going to keep taking them because I am so excited to see my results in a couple months from now. Nutrafol's hair growth supplements are physician formulated and they only use drug-free high quality ingredients. That means you can just purchase them online. There's no prescription or doctor's visit required. Start your hair growth journey today by taking Nutrafol's hair wellness quiz and get your personalized hair health plan today. For a limited time, Nutrafol is offering my viewers $10 off your first month subscription and free shipping at Nutrafol.com slash quiz when you enter the promo code the horrible. Take the quiz and get started on reaching your hair wellness goals with Nutrafol today. That's Nutrafol.com spelled N-U-T-R-A-F-O-L.com slash quiz with the promo code the horrible. That's Nutrafol.com slash quiz Promo code, the horrible. On September 27th, 2014, 19-year-old Jansen McGee returned to his home with his girlfriend in Springville, Utah. Immediately, something fell off. Really off. He entered his house and it was quiet. Too quiet. The type of quiet that you never want to experience yourself because it's the type of quiet that is deafening. There were no sign of his parents or three younger siblings. He goes upstairs to check his parents' bedroom, but the door is closed. And when he turns the doorknob, he can't open it. Something was definitely wrong. He could feel it. Instead of forcing it open, the boy called his grandmother. His grandmother, Valerie Sudweeks, came right away and forced the door open. Inside was this teenager's five family members, his parents and his three siblings. However, they were no longer alive. Maureen Ledbetter, who was a family friend, she was called over. She was probably close by and came as well. The grandmother, Valerie, was in absolute hysterics, so she could not do anything. So Maureen called 911. Valerie can be heard in the background of this call screaming. Maureen tells the dispatcher the whole family has killed themselves. And the scene was 
grisly, for lack of a better word. Benson Strack, who was 14 years old, along with his younger sister, Emery, who was 12 years old, were both laying next to each other on a mattress near their parents' bed. 11-year-old Zion, the third sibling and the youngest, was cuddled up with his parents on their bed. He was under the blankets with his mother, but his father, who was also in the bed with them, was over the blankets. The father, Benjamin Strack, is thought to have passed away last because he was not under the blankets. Christy was the mother who was holding her son, Zion, in the bed. When authorities came to process the scene, the biggest thing they found was drugs. A lot of drugs. I'm going to actually read this quote directly from a Washington Post article because I don't want to mess it up. They found empty containers of cold and flu medication, allergy medication, sleeping medication, pain reliever, and cherry flavored liquid methadone. And they found a plastic sand pail filled with a lethal yellowish orange concoction, a mixture of the drugs. Now, before we go on, just a quick note, I know people are going to ask, if you know, you know, methadone is a drug that is often used to treat heroin addiction. So that is the reason why methadone was in the home. It was in the home legally. It was prescribed to Christy, who had suffered from heroin addiction in the past, as well as Benjamin, her husband. At the autopsies, doctors found that all three children had lethal doses of a concoction of these drugs in their systems. Christy had these drugs in her system as well. However, she also had dextrophan, which is a cough suppressant, as well as doxylamine, which is a sleep aid. Benjamin, the father, seemed to have just OD'd on heroin. Both Benjamin and Christy, the parents, their cause of death was listed as suicide. But 11-year-old Zion and 12-year-old Emery, their cause of death was both listed as murder. It was determined that they were too young to consent to this suicide pact, so it seemed, and so it was determined that their parents actually murdered them. Interestingly enough, though, is that it was not the same for 14-year-old Benson. His cause of death was and has been always listed as undetermined. They apparently couldn't decide whether he was old enough to consent to all this and if he actually made this decision himself or not. My extremely personal opinion, and I am not an expert in this field whatsoever, so take my opinion with a grain of salt, but I personally think that he could not have consented to this if he wasn't brainwashed by his parents, which we'll learn about in a minute. I don't think that this would have happened. I don't think Benson would have carried this out if it weren't for his parents. So I personally believe that his cause of death should be murder as well. However, it is a confusing part of this story because 14-year-old Benson, he was the only one in the family that left a note. It wasn't a ending days note. It wasn't a note to people about why they did this. It was a note to his best friend, telling his best friend that he wanted to leave his possessions to him. It also said that he... Something along the lines, I don't have the exact word for word of the note, but something along the lines of, I don't think I'm going to exist on this planet anymore. Then they also found a notebook that the family had written to-do lists in. Things like feed the pets and find someone to watch over the house. This indicates that they were probably planning this for quite a while. There was no signs of a struggle, as we kind of implied already, so it seems like they planned this, but also got the children on board, somehow convinced the children that this is what needed to be done. So let's talk about that. Why? Why did Christy and Benjamin do this? Well... <laughs> It was later determined that the two were extremely religious, not in the healthy way. They were afraid that the world was just evil, and they were certain that a pending apocalypse was just around the corner. Friends and families did confirm that Christy and Benjamin would talk about a pending apocalypse quite often. They kind of knew that this horrific tragedy could be part of their plans in the future, but they kind of hoped that it wasn't going to go that far. The way they talked about it, it seemed more like they were just afraid of being in the general population when this apocalypse was supposedly going to happen. And it was seemed more 
more like they were going to pack up all their stuff and move away suddenly, just kind of disappear and move off the grid so that when this apocalypse that they were convinced was going to happen happened, they would be safe. They would be away from everybody. But that's not what they did. They instead went this other extremely drastic route. And all of that that we just talked about, you'd think that would be kind of the whole story, but that's not even the most disturbing part about this case. There was a strange, bizarre twist to this whole thing. Benjamin and Christy were actually close friends with Dan Lafferty. If you have no idea what I'm talking about, I will give you a refresh. Dan Lafferty and his brother, Ron Lafferty, murdered their sister-in-law, Brenda Wright Lafferty, and Brenda's 15-month-old daughter, Erica, on July 24th, 1984. In order to carry out this murder, Ron and Dan slit their throats. After being caught, they claimed that Ron was a prophet and that they were ordered by God to carry out the murders. Regardless, they were both determined to be mentally well enough to stand trial. Dan ended up getting two life sentences without the possibility of parole, and Ron was given the death penalty. However, Ron passed away from natural causes in prison in 2019 at the age of 78. Dan is still in prison to this day. That, of course, is a very summarized version of events, but if it's ringing a bell for you, it's probably because you have heard of this story or at least are vaguely, vaguely familiar with it. That's because this is the exact crime detailed in John Krakauer's book, Under the Banner of Heaven, which, as many of you know, was also later a TV drama. And last, a big piece of this, unfortunately, is that Ron and Dan were fundamentalist members of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, aka they were fundamentalist Mormons. Now, as always, I just want to be clear, I am not stating anything about general LDS people. I know they are not all fundamentalists. I just want to be very clear that it's none of my business what you believe. However, fundamentalism is not normal religion. It is safe to say, although I could not find a source to confirm this, but it is likely that Christy and Benjamin living in Utah, having four children, it's probably likely that they were Latter-day Saints as well. I don't know how fundamentalist they were, but it seems like perhaps they were quite fundamentalist. So Christy and Benjamin were real good friends with Dan Lafferty from prison. While searching the home, authorities found letters from Dan Lafferty in prison to Christy. The two had been corresponding for quite a while from their prison cell. Benjamin and Christy even went to go visit Dan in prison quite a lot. And the three of them became very good friends. And if you don't believe me, Dan Lafferty actually put in his will that he wanted the Strax to have his remains after he passes away. He was going to get cremated. He wanted Benjamin and Christy to have his ashes. Is this all relevant? Well, to be honest, we don't really know. Reported Benjamin and Christy hadn't actually been in contact with Dan since 2008, which was several years before this tragedy. So they had been kind of out of contact for quite a while. Police did go to Dan in prison and interviewed him about the Strax and just asked if he knew any more. They were trying to figure out what really happened. Dan said that he had no idea that they were planning this and he actually seemed genuinely sad that they were gone. So is it relevant? Again, we don't know. However, I do think it's important to note because it really shows us the kind of mental state that Benjamin and Christy were in. They were clearly not mentally well. It's really unhealthy to become obsessed with a killer in general, let alone make actual contact with them and then become friends with them. And again, this is speculation, but in my opinion, I kind of wonder if Christy really, really felt that connection with Dan because she felt that she was getting a similar calling from God to carry this out 
to her family in order to be called back to God. That she heard a message from God that the apocalypse was coming. It was something that she knew that others didn't, Benjamin too, and that she really related and resonated with Dan's story because he did something that he carried out because he he got a message from God while he and his brother got a message from God. And so Christy really felt that nobody, that they were very misunderstood and that she understood them and they could understand her and that the rest of the world was completely misguided and they were the only small group that knew the truth. Again, that's speculation based on what I know. However, that's where my mind goes. Regardless, Benjamin and Christy took three innocent young lives. I really have a hard time feeling sorry for Benjamin and Christy. I feel like even though they were clearly mentally ill, I do think that they were not so mentally ill that they didn't know that killing bad and like why did they have to take their children down with them why couldn't they let them go and if they really needed to do this just did it for themselves i think that's why i don't let them off the hook because i think they very well could have gotten help and they could have had somebody take the children and take care of the children i do think that this was kind of a cult benjamin and christy were the leaders and their children were their followers their unconsenting followers who were brainwashed. I think Benjamin and Christy brainwashed the kids into thinking that death was not final. And the reason I think this is because of Benson's note kind of implying that I'm not going to exist on this planet anymore, not necessarily not exist in general. And I think the parents the kids being so young could have easily brainwashed them. I mean, think about how much you understood about death at that age. And if your parents told you that we're not dying, we're going to another planet or we're going to God or we're going to this or that, they could probably convince the kids that this wasn't actually final like death is. The only solace we have is that the children, it was shown that they did go to sleep before they passed away. I know that's incredibly morbid, but it gives me a weird comfort to know that they did not seem to suffer. But either way, those kids deserved so much better. Okay, this next story is one of those that you're really not going to know where it's going at first, so stick with me for a moment. On October 9th, 2001, Bulgarian phone company Mobiltel's CEO Vladimir Grashnov tragically died after battling cancer. He was only 48 years old. However, many people believed that while he did have cancer, he was actually murdered by a rival in the business. It was speculated that Vladimir was actually poisoned with radioactive substances to cause the cancer, a clever, long game way to carry out a murder that would almost securely guarantee that the murderer would not get caught. Again, these are just rumors. We don't know if this is true for sure. Then on December 6, 2003, 33-year-old Konstantin Dimitri Dimitrov, a well-known Bulgarian mobster, was shot dead in Dam Square in Amsterdam. He had a drug business reported to be worth hundreds of millions of dollars, and he was on business in the area checking on his drug business when a Russian assassin from a rival mafia, someone who was jealous of his business, shot him to death. Then, in 2005, a man named Konstantin Dishliev, unrelated, I know two of these men have the same first name, but they are not the same man, he was outside of an Indian restaurant in Bulgaria's capital, Sofia, when he was also gunned down and killed by an unknown assailant. Dishlev was also in the cocaine business, so it's likely that he was assassinated due to some sort of rival gang business. Strangely enough, not much else is known about these three men's deaths, and I looked. So why am I telling you about them, you may be asking? I just told you about three men, all unrelated, other than the fact that they all lived in the same area ish, but all unrelated to each other. All three of them died within five years. The main thing that they had in common was that they all had the same phone number. The phone number had been passed down from one man to the next, 
all three of these men dying within five years. First, Vladimir Grashnov. He was the CEO of the mobile company that issued this number to begin with. He died from cancer in 2001. The phone number was then in circulation again, and this time Konstantin Dimitrov got it, and he was murdered in 2003. After his death, the number was in circulation again, and this time it went to the third man, Konstantin Dishlev, who would then go on to die in 2005. And if you're to believe the conspiracy theories and the rumors about Vladimir, the first victim, it is speculated that he was murdered and that he didn't actually die from cancer. So if you do believe that theory, it means that all three of these men were also murdered not long after getting this phone number. Even more spooky, the phone number was 888 888 888. It's not some random number. It's only the number made up of eights. So you may be thinking, is this just a coincidence? Well, of course that is completely possible. And my first thought when doing research on this story was how many other people have had this phone number who haven't died? Is it just because we nitpicked these three that happened to have this number and they passed away? But the answer is none. And the reason is because the phone companies took this phone number out of circulation. It's no longer available for anybody to take because of the superstition around this phone number. After the third man died with this same phone number, they took it out of circulation, all for superstition. So we'll never really know if it's a strange coincidence or not. Again, you're probably thinking, I'm sure it's just a coincidence. That is wild, but it must just be some really crazy happenstance. And for those of you who are saying it's just a coincidence, I, I have to ask, would you take this phone number? Honestly, would you take this phone number? Would you risk it? If you think it's just a coincidence, but you still wouldn't take it just on the tiny minuscule chance, then that means congratulations, my friend. You do believe this just a tiny bit. <laughs> Okay, we are now going to take our stories over to Poland. I want to apologize in advance because these people are from Poland. It's very hard to pronounce their names with my very, very uh, American accent. So I do apologize in advance if I am saying these names incorrectly. I will, as always, try my best. This story was actually a tip off from one of my subscribers, my subscriber Katzenel, and I hope I'm saying your name right, even though you wrote it out phonetically for me. Still hoping I'm saying it right. Thank you, Katzenel, for emailing me this submission and tipping me off to this story. Now, the reason that this next story is so so disturbing is because there is a video of the entire thing going down. This is a video of a horrific murder-suicide that happened not only in broad daylight, but in public in the city of Poznan in Poland in July 2023. Now, obviously, and I'm sorry, but this is YouTube. I wouldn't show people this video anyway because I don't believe in spreading graphic gore videos. For those of you, and I know you're out there, that are pausing this video to immediately go find the video and watch it for yourselves. I can't stop you. I assume you're an adult and that you can make that decision for yourself. However, I just have to give the warning that this video is incredibly disturbing. It's very, very distressing. The people, it's, it's not a picture, it's a video. The person in the video is incredibly distressed. And if you have a uh, average amount of empathy, it's going to be distressing to watch her in distress. And then it's just violent and graphic and terrible. So that being said, I highly recommend not going to watch the video, especially because I'm going to tell you what happens in the video now in order to tell the story. So the video shows three people. They are outside of a hotel in Poznan. When the video starts, one of the men is already dead. So this was Cordon Damagala. He was the main victim of this case. He was either 30 or 31 years old. The sources are not clear on his age. So then we have 20-year-old Julia Harm. Masiniska. She is in the video. She is in the white pants. She's frantic. 
very distressed. She's pacing around the shooter and she's screaming in Polish, of course, for someone to please help. She's screaming over and over. You even see two women on their phones just to the right of the frame at one point. No doubt they're just not moving because they're just in total shock of what they are witnessing. I don't think they even know what to do. So Julia bends over Corden in the video. Corden was her fiance of two weeks. They had just gotten engaged. They were on a romantic getaway when this happened. She even briefly touches his face to see if there were any signs of life in him or it's just anguish. She stands up again and goes back to the shooter. You can see that her hands are covered in blood and she's screaming for help over and over. The shooter, who again, the age is not clear, but he was either 30 or 31 years old. The shooter was Mikolaj Bakos. Again, I'm sorry for pronunciation. This is Julia's ex-boyfriend. I bet a lot of you saw that coming. And I think the most disturbing part about this video that really, really gets to you is that he looks thrilled. This is like the happiest day of his life to see Julia go through this anguish. He is calmly walking around her. He's pacing, but he's not pointing the weapon at Julia. He has it pointed at the ground. He even touches Julia's arm at one point in the video, which is just, I don't know why, but that is so unhinged to me. That, that upsets me almost more than the rest of the video, just because it's like, you're in the middle of carrying out something so horrific. Don't touch anyone. The fact that she t he touches her arm as if to like say, yep, like I'm loving this or like, oh, calm down. Like just such a casual thing to do to touch somebody's arm as if you're moving them out of the way, as if you're telling them, hey, I'm here, excuse me. You know what I mean? Like just such a weird casual thing to do that I just find so incredibly disturbing. Julia goes back to her fiance and leans over that over him, this time like one leg on either side of him. And again, she's like looking at his face to see I don't know if she's just seeing if he can be saved or if she's just, I'm sure just in complete shock and just has, and doesn't know what to do. Who would know what to do? She stands back up and confronts Mikolaj, which is so bizarre. They get in a short, like, I don't want to say altercation, but they kind of like uh, push each other a little bit with their arms. Like she tries to push him away from her fiance's body and he like kind of pushes her back. And it almost looks like he's going to shoot Julia at this point, but he doesn't. He shoots her fiance again. The hatred that this man has in his heart is just unbelievable that he's already gone and you just, you have to do it more. It's so personal. He then calmly pulls an object from his ear. It looks like we don't know what the object is, but... Most people believe that it was likely headphones, like AirPods or something like that, which again is so bizarre. Were you listening to music while hyping yourself up to do this or something? And why take it out? He takes it out and puts it on the table. He then takes his hat off and calmly puts it down on the table. He goes back to Julia. He's making intense eye contact. He looks her right in the eyes. You can't really see because the video is so far away, but it certainly looks like he's got a big grin on his face. He then, sorry, I'm trying to keep this somewhat YouTube friendly. I'm trying not to say the word too much, but he then passes away by his own hands right on the spot in front of her. You get it. You get it, right? This part of the video though is actually insane because Julia, like, she does scream that he does that, but she doesn't really care. She screams in reaction, but it's almost like, okay, well, thank God, at least he's gone. At least he can't hurt me or other people or my fiance even more than he already has. Because you could tell the love that she has for this man that just died in front of her, her fiance, not the other guy, of course. The video ends by her just going back over to her fiance which is just like really, I don't know, that just says everything about Julia to me, that she just like, all she cares about is that the love of her life is gone. Like she just, 
that's all she cares about in this moment. The other thing that really strikes me about this video, I don't know if it's a cultural thing or shock, like people were just in shock, but um, I found it really interesting that nobody seemed to be running away. A car during the video drives by very slowly, which if it were me, I wouldn't be anywhere near that scene. I don't know about you, but if I heard a gunshot, I would, I would run. It might just be because I'm American and it's hardwired in our brain that if you hear something that sounds like a firework, if it's if it could be a gunshot, like find the exit and you hide or run immediately. Like maybe it's just ingrained in American culture. But if this were me, like I would, you know, there's there's witnesses right there that are just standing there. I'm sure they're calling emergency services, but then a car slowly drives by as if they're trying to figure out what the hell is going on. And then Julia herself doesn't run away. It's wild that Julia doesn't run away. He just, like, if you can't save your fiancé, I don't think anybody would fault her for running away thinking that she was next. Again, I don't know if it was just utter shock, so much love and compassion for, for her fiancé that she just could not leave his side no matter what. Like, I don't know if that's what it was or she didn't care if he got her too because her life was over anyway. It's just so interesting. I love the human nature. I love observing human nature like this because she like goes and confronts hit the shooter and like even like shoves him a little bit to like tell him to get the fuck out of here. And it's just, I don't know. It's just so interesting. I just don't understand why nobody's running. I feel like in most cases, if there's an active shooter, people run because they don't know what they're going to do. So it could just be a cultural thing. Maybe it's just, yeah, or maybe it's just shock. But I, I observing that about the video was really interesting. I feel like if you saw that same video in the States, you would just see people running away. So then the other odd thing is that people um, speculate and wonder why he took his hat off. What was the point of taking his hat off before then? I don't know. I don't have an answer. However, I... Um, read a few Reddit comments. Some of the Reddit comments in this thread had some really interesting answers. So one comment said they did it to further humanize himself, thus making the intense eye contact, brain blowing extravaganda even more traumatic for his ex. One last memorable fuck you. Really fucked up shit, but that guy knew what he was doing. So this comment speculates that he was doing it to make it more traumatic for Julia. Like he wanted her to see him as a person before he did this, which I think, you know, or make it more, make it more traumatic for her. Another comment suggested that it was to lessen whatever resistance the hat would pose against the uh, weapon or probably just human instinct to remove the cap so it's not in the way. That could be like his brain was probably like he was probably not thinking incredibly clearly at this point. And like, it was kind of like a, who cares what I do? Might as well take it off. And then another comment said, making a point in his mind with the additional theatrics. And yeah, I think that's similar to the first comment, but I would agree with that as well, that he was literally just doing it because the whole point of this was to make, put Julia through as much pain as he possibly could. Notice he doesn't kill her. He spares her life because he wants her to live with this instead. So like you've probably figured out by now on your own, Mikolaj has never been over their breakup. Julia and Mikolaj used to date. He was mad that he was no longer with Julia, that she had broken up with him and he handled it in the most cowardly, horrific way anybody could. He had apparently recently saw pictures of Julia and her new fiance on social media, which seemed to trigger this whole thing for him. This was obviously just so ridiculously senseless. So the victim, Cordian. So Cordian was said to be one of the most positive and happiest people you ever met. He was always smiling. He was kind to everyone. He was a blogger. He was an artist and his job. He worked as a local counselor. He will not be forgotten by any of his loved ones, including Julia. As for Julia, not a lot is known about her and her life, but I cannot even begin to imagine what it must be like to go through something this horrific at any age, let alone 20 years old, when you're still like literally just left teenagerhood. 
I can't imagine. I do really hope for Julia that she is able to find therapy and help to heal through this. She deserves to go on and live a happy life and find joyful relationships. I really hope that she doesn't blame herself for this because this is not anything she could prevent it. She didn't do anything wrong. All she did was move on with her life and she had every right to break up with somebody for whatever reason. Let's move on to Central Eastern Pennsylvania. This is a deep mystery from Reddit. Since as early as 2019, people in Pennsylvania have been finding strange notes in random items that they take home from grocery stores. The notes always look something like this, and there are small differences between the notes, but for the most part, they say the same thing. Don't bother trying to pause and read them right now. It's pretty much utter nonsense and there's almost no point in trying to decipher them. There's an entire subreddit dedicated to this mystery where people are still sharing pictures of notes that they find to this day. And that is to document where, when, and like in what object they found the note as well as swap theories and try to unravel this mystery. In December, 2023, which was literally just a few months ago, as of recording, a man found one of these notes in his box of Lucky Charms s'mores flavored cereal. Poured it out in my bowl and out comes uh, this paper that was all folded up just like this. The note contains a mashup of words and references to current events and conspiracy theories. Miller says his big concern is that somehow a note made its way into a sealed food product. I don't know what's inside the cereal or this note was laced with anything. It's not the note that really bothers me, it's just what was, it's, uh, these notes are found inside food. The man claims that the note was found within the sealed cereal bag, like not just within the box. However, there's no way to confirm that. And that's important. All of the other notes so far, as far as we know at least, have been in the box, but not in the actual container containing the food. So for example, cake mix, like you would find the note in between the box, the cardboard and the actual plastic bag where the powdered mix is in, the note would be in between there, not actually in the sealed bag. So the first thing that most people say when they hear about this is, well, it must be the manufacturers. It must be somebody in the factory sneaking these in on the factory line. However, if you think about it, this doesn't make a lot of sense because there's no consistency to where these notes are found. They're found in anything from dog food to like we talked about cereal. People have found them in Pop-Tart boxes. They have found them in pasta, cake mixes, dog food, a Tylenol package, Lunchables, crackers, like in a lot of different items. And so therefore that means that these notes are being slipped into the products after they've already made it to the floor of the store. Some speculate that this person is actually buying the items, bringing them home. That way they can tamper with them, slip the notes in and reseal the packages. And then they just return to the store with them and subtly slip them back on the shelves. However, I remind you that other than that one cereal box found by that man who he claimed it was on the inside of the sealed bag, all the other notes have not actually been found within sealed bags, but rather just in the cardboard outside packaging. And me personally, since there's no proof that this man actually took it out of a sealed cereal bag, which makes sense. Like it's not like he films himself opening everything that he ever is going to eat, right? But I personally think that it's quite possible that the note was in between the bag and the box and he opened the bag inside of the box without seeing the note. He tipped the box with the cereal inside of it over to pour it in the bowl and then the note fell out like slipped out from between the plastic and the cardboard box and so to the man's perspective it looked as if it came out of the bag when it really didn't so assuming that it didn't actually go in the sealed cereal bag all the notes that we know of have not been actually in sealed plastic bags of food 
So therefore, it is possible that somebody is just going into the stores, picking random food items or home items, and then folding up the note and using their key or something flat and small to shove the note in between the cracks of the box. All you'd have to do is squeeze the box to look for a seam that would open and you could slip it in there. People on Reddit have tried to do this themselves and have been able to do it with relative ease. And it's also not just food. People on Reddit are saying that they find these notes in the pockets of clothes that they buy from retail stores. They find them pinned to trees on walking trails, on the floor, just at random stores. They'll see it on the floor in the aisles. Whoever's doing this is taking it very seriously. And if this person ever gets caught, they could be responsible for some criminal charges. I mean, this is tampering with food. So if this case is not new to you and you have happened to hear about it before, you have probably watched Scare Theater's video on it. I'll link his video in the description because it's very, very well done. He does a lot more detailed analysis and a lot more uh, detailed investigation. One of the things that Scare Theater does in his video is puts the notes text into chat GPT and then he asks ChatGPT to translate, to explain what the note says. That's why I told you there was no point in pausing the screen to try to read what the note says, because honestly, it's not that exciting. It's not like there's some hidden puzzle or secret message hidden within these notes. It's the theme of all the notes seems to be a lot of talk about secret societies, conspiracies, lots of Trump kind of QAnon stuff. This entire mystery has been named the Schuylkill Notes, named after the area in Pennsylvania where most, the vast majority of these notes have been found. Several people on Reddit have confirmed that the notes seem a lot like the thought patterns of either themselves or a loved one that they have witnessed go through some sort of psychotic or schizophrenic episode. So the weird grammar, the weird shortening of words, the weird punctuation, and just the ramblings themselves. And of course, I don't think anybody would think it's much of a stretch to assume that whoever is doing this is suffering from some sort of mental illness. I'm not here to diagnose, of course, but it's got to be something going on. Something is happening. Something You are suffering from something to believe this stuff not only so deeply, but to believe that you are the one that needs to spread the message to the world by doing these things. And the mystery continues. Like when you go to the subreddit, I mean, there's posts from as recent as a few hours ago to a day ago, like there's people that are still finding these notes everywhere. And just imagine how many people are finding these notes and just like tossing them. Not that they don't know about this entire mystery. They don't know about Reddit. They don't know about subreddits. So they just like see it and they're like, oh, that's weird. And then they toss it away. You know what I mean? So like, it's probably even more than what the Reddit is portraying it to be. Lastly, it's also important to note that of course there probably are copycats. Scare Theater goes more into this in his video. I'm sure there are people out there that have replicated the notes and done this exact same thing just to keep the mystery going. In any sort of popular mystery, there's always copycats. Scare Theater goes more into this in his video about how there likely are copycats, but he does have reason to believe that they are definitely not all copycats. Again, I will link his video down below in the description so you can go over there and watch his video after you finish this one. Overall, very, very strange. While technically this is a crime tampering with food that you don't own, it is clear that whoever's doing this doesn't actually want to hurt anybody because nobody, as far as we know, who have found one of these notes has ever gotten sick or suffered any ill effects. Like I said, I think this has to be somebody suffering from mental illness and their mental illness is telling them that they need to spread this message around to the world and that putting it in random containers of food is the only way to do it. And that is about all we know right now. Like I said, this is still going on and continues to go on. I would love for this to be solved one day. I wonder if somebody is ever going to get caught on CCTV or just a random person catch them put something in the food and report it. And then I wonder if this person ever gets caught. They might get a little bit of jail time for this if they are convicted. But 
you know, since they're not hurting anybody, it probably wouldn't be that much. I would hope they'd get caught just so that they could get the mental health help that they need, because clearly there is something going on here. At the end of 1981 and the beginning of 1982, churchgoers and staff were finding mysterious notes when they went to Sunday services at the Christ United Methodist Church in Memphis, Tennessee. The notes were left in Bibles, in the church pews, around the kitchen, in the bathroom, and they were all pleading. One note said, quote, Please help me. My name is Leslie Gaddis. Call the police immediately. Call my father, George A. Gaddis. He is vice president of Fred G. Gaddis Company. I am in attic with the man who kidnapped me. Show this note to the police. They have been looking for me for a long time. I left this note on your desk when he wasn't looking. This is no joke. Thank you and God bless you. Leslie Gaddis, March 18th, 1982. Hurry, we come down at night, 1030 or 11. So several of these notes were found around the church by churchgoers over the months and nobody investigated them. Leslie Marie Gaddis was a missing person in the area. However, in spite of that, nobody took these notes seriously still. The problem was that everybody in the church who found these notes thought that it was some sort of cruel hoax. They assumed that teenagers were just leaving these notes around as a prank. It especially didn't help that when Leslie first went missing, police believed that she was a runaway. As in the 70s and 80s, most kids that go missing were often just shrugged off as a runaway. However, we wouldn't be talking about this story right now if the notes weren't real. The notes were indeed real. Leslie was being held captive in that church and nobody knew for four months, and she really was leaving notes as a cry for help. Leslie Marie Gaddis was a 15-year-old sophomore at St. Agnes Academy in Tennessee. She came from a good home with good parents. She got good grades. She was a cheerleader. Her father was a well-known, very wealthy businessman in the area. On November 18, 1981, Leslie invited some of her church friends over for a prayer night. After her friends left her house, she got ready for bed and went to sleep. At approximately 2.30 a.m. on the morning of November 19th, while Leslie and her parents were fast asleep, a man named Ernest Stubblefield entered their home through a laundry room window. At first, he just loitered downstairs. He spent an hour downstairs, just hanging out. Then he finally went upstairs to the only bedroom door that was open, which happened to be Leslie. He went into her room, he covered her mouth so that she couldn't scream upon waking up, and he threatened her with a knife. Leslie wakes up from a sound sleep to a man with yellow teeth over her bed. Very weirdly, the first thing Ernest asks her is, are you a boy or a girl? And Leslie replies, girl. Ernest proceeds to put duct tape around Leslie's ankles and her wrists. And then at knife point, he picked her up and carried her to the family car. Not to his car, to the Gaddis's car. As he carried Leslie down the stairs, he needed to take a couple breathers. He needed to take a couple breaks. Leslie was only 118 pounds at the time, but Ernest was just a weak man. He couldn't carry her all the way. He put her in the family Cadillac and they drove away. He drove her the almost three miles to the Christ United Methodist Church at 4488 Poplar Avenue in Memphis, Tennessee. He put her in the choir's loft crawl space in the church in the attic and he told her not to move. He then drove the car back to Leslie's house, left it there, as if nothing happened, and then walked the several miles back to the church. And Leslie would be held captive in that church with Ernest for the next four months. So a, I guess you could look at it as a fortunate part of this story is that in those four months, Ernest never hurts Leslie. He never uses the knife on her. He never sexually assaults her, barely touches her other than maybe grabbing her arm, but he doesn't abuse her or hit her Nothing, nothing weird happened other than the fact that he was holding her captive. Ernest, for lack of a better word, was always nice 
to Leslie. Leslie was kept in not so great conditions. During the day, she had to stay up in that choir crawl space and it was a pretty small dark space. So it was quite uncomfortable. But then at night, just like Leslie's notes indicated around 1030 or 11, Ernest would let her out and they would both go downstairs. That way, Leslie could use the bathrooms in the church. They raided the kitchens and ate a bunch of food from the kitchens. Ernest would make Leslie play Scrabble with him. I'm sure other games as well. And they would even watch television together. Initially, Ernest did tell Leslie that the whole point of her kidnap was for ransom. Her father was a very, very wealthy businessman. So that would make sense. It made sense to Leslie. So Leslie started writing letters to her family for Ernest to deliver, telling her family that she's okay, but that this man wants money. She gave them to Ernest and he said that he delivered them to the family and she would check the papers every day. But she assumed that the reason the ransom uh, demands were not in the paper, but Leslie just assumed the police didn't want to disclose the information to keep the case secure. What Ernest didn't tell her is that he just never delivered the letters. He said it was for ransom, but for whatever reason, Ernest never asked anyone for a ransom or any type of monetary gain for the kidnapping of Leslie. So when they went downstairs at night, when Ernest wasn't looking or when he was out of the room, Leslie would write these notes up really quick and leave them in inconspicuous places around the church, hoping that people would find them and report that she was there somewhere. And then during the day, police would rescue her. That wasn't all she did though. When they went to go eat food out of the kitchen, Leslie would stuff her face with food. She would eat as much Food. She said she ate so much food that she felt sick and she ate so much food, not because she was so hungry from being held captive all day, although I can't imagine she wasn't hungry, but she ate as much food as she possibly could because she wanted it to be obvious that food was missing from the kitchen. She wanted it to be very obvious to the staff when they came in the next day that all of this food was missing and then hopefully they would report it and then the police would again investigate the church and find her her. But it didn't. It didn't work. One night, Leslie went downstairs and found a note in the kitchen that just said from one of the staff, please stop stealing our coffee. <laughs> So I cannot imagine the frustration and the hopelessness she must have felt when it's literally like you're shouting from the rooftops, I'm here. I'm right here, like in those terrible dreams when you're screaming and no one hears you and everybody just ignores you. So finally, March 18th, 1982, Leslie was finally saved after being held captive for 119 days, just one day short of four full months. Her and Ernest were in the kitchen, of course, as they did every night, but these notes and everything around had actually raised some suspicions, obviously not enough for it to be taken seriously enough because she could have been rescued months ago, but they did start to find it weird. So they were sending staff around a little more often. So Ernest imagined his shock when two janitors come in in the middle of the night and catch him and Leslie just standing in the kitchen. Ernest immediately grabbed Leslie's arm. There was a short struggle between the janitors and Ernest, but when Ernest realized quickly he was outnumbered, he let go of Leslie's arms, thank God, and he fled the scene. Ernest was on the run for weeks before he was found. He was finally found at another church a few miles away in a crawl space, and naked? He was naked. I don't know why, but he was naked. A police dog actually found him and he suffered minor dog bites because the police dog attacked him. He was arrested and he would spend 20 years in prison for this crime. So like I said, he never physically hurt Leslie. He never sexually assaulted her. He never got a ransom or asked for a ransom for doing this. So what the fuck did he want? Well, of course, we will never really know for sure. However, it's thought that he became quite attached to Leslie and he did actually really enjoy 
her as a person and enjoyed her company. And he knew asking for a ransom, Leslie would be saved. And then that would end their what in his mind was a friendship. Another theory that is similar is that Leslie kind of was a replacement for Ernest's own daughter named Patty. Ernest had been divorced from his wife. And according to his ex-wife, he really, really did not agree with the divorce. He did not want to get divorced and he saw it as kind of like abandonment. He wanted the family to stay together. And Ernest's ex-wife would also say that there were some occasions where Ernest actually tried to take Patty, take her away and kind of like kidnap her and take her to another state. And so it is thought by many that maybe Leslie, even though they didn't look much alike reportedly, that it was kind of a replacement so that he could feel like he still had a daughter since he didn't get to see his own daughter. Just because we have this speculated motive for this crime doesn't make it okay, obviously. Like, Ernest, I'm sorry you were lonely and sad, but like you don't get to traumatize a child just because you're sad. That's not the way it works. So I personally think that 20 years in prison was a pretty adequate sentence for something like this since he did not hurt her physically. 20 years is a pretty hefty sentence. I feel like a lot of people get less prison times for way worse crimes. So I do think that that's a pretty adequate sentence in my opinion. So Leslie though has a happy ending and I'm glad to end this video with a happy ending. She was reunited with her family. She was returned unharmed. Of course, I'm sure she suffered very big emotional scars. I'm sure that it was many years of struggle to recover from something so unbelievably traumatic and terrifying. She's often referred to as the OG Elizabeth Smart or the lesser known Elizabeth Smart. And I'm also happy to report that she is still alive and well today. She is thriving and she is a lawyer. She wanted to be a doctor when she was a kid before this happened, but then after this happened, she decided she wanted to get into law and help others. And she became specifically a family attorney. So that is Leslie Marie Gaddis. So that's going to be it for our stories today. I hope you enjoyed this video. I, I know I always say that, but obviously I don't mean like enjoyed like these stories are happy because they're not and they involve real people and really terrible things that happen to them. So thank you guys so much for watching anyway and uh please like the video just to support the channel don't forget our sponsor neutrophil and i'll see you all in the next video thank you so much to all of our patrons on the screen shout out to our newest alien top tiers m kurtz and mostly good vibes